Did you know that you spend 8% of your entire life paralyzed? Physically paralyzed, unable to move. It's not a trick question, but it's actually a part of our lives that often goes unexamined, our sleep. See, we spend about one third of our entire life sleeping and about one quarter of that time in dream sleep. So you actually spend 8% of your life dreaming. During this, thoughts and emotions run through your brain, believed to be the basis of our dreams, and our bodies are paralyzed so that we do not act out our dreams as that would be quite dangerous. What I've just described is just a small sliver of the fascinating adventure that we all take every single night hidden behind our own eyelids. Yet, we often see sleep as a blank space, a luxury, or worse, a sign of laziness or weakness. But sleep is not a blank space at all. And bragging about how little sleep we get isn't the answer. We kind of think we are stronger than sleep, right? So today, I want to introduce you to this one third of our lives, how it impacts the rest of our lives, and our two greatest challenges to accessing sleep's benefits. Because I believe that sleep is powerful. It can be harnessed for good, but can also bring us down in ways we might never have imagined. In fact, my own life was brought down by sleep, but that really wasn't how I saw it at the time. It began with laughter. I was 21 years old, standing in the living room of my first grown-up apartment in Boston, joking around with my roommate, when, as I laughed, my knees slightly buckled under me, almost as, as if someone had poked behind my knees, but no one had. This strange momentary sensation went away quickly, so I didn't think that much of it, until a few weeks later when I felt that same feeling again when I was laughing. After a few times like this, I started to say to my friends, don't make me laugh, my knees, my knees. Around that same time, one night, I awoke to hear a burglar breaking into our apartment, and I saw a man rush at me with his arms stretch out towards my neck. The strange thing is I couldn't move to get away from him, so I just shuddered in terror, only to realize later there had been no burglar. About a year later, at age 22, I started law school. And I knew it would be challenging, but honestly, I wasn't that concerned. I'd always been known for my strong work ethic. But law school did prove more challenging than I imagined. My class notes were often a jumbled, nonsensical mess. And I would read these giant textbooks diligently for hours, only to realize I didn't remember what I'd read. At the end of my first year of law school, I got so tired driving just 15 minutes to school in the morning that I didn't remember my drive, pulling into school, choosing a parking spot. And that really scared me. And for the first time, I thought, I might have a sleep problem. <laughs> Even though the first primary care doctor I went to see told me that my sleepiness may be normal, <laughs> that even she had to pull over and get a coffee when she drove sometimes, I continued looking for answers, eventually undergoing a 24-hour sleep study and going to the follow-up appointment with a world-renowned sleep specialist in a big, fancy Boston hospital. This sleep doctor was now marveling at the results of my sleep study because apparently I'd gone into dream sleep so quickly and frequently during that sleep study that he couldn't wait to show his residents the results of my study. Honestly, at the time, I wanted to be a great law student, not a great neurological patient. But I guess there was kind of a strange sense of satisfaction that even people at Harvard were impressed by my brain. <laughs> what happened next, though, shocked me. The doctor diagnosed me with narcolepsy. I thought, narcolepsy? Oh, no, 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 no. That's a joke about someone falling asleep in their cereal bowl. That's not me. <laughs> well, it turns out movies got narcolepsy wrong. So what is narcolepsy? It's actually a neurological disorder of the sleep-wake cycle, affecting about one in every 2,000 people. 
Researchers in 1999 discovered that a very particular group of neurotransmitters help to regulate dream sleep. And in people with narcolepsy, these neurotransmitters go inactive, leading to aspects of dream sleep invading into the daytime, where dream sleep does not belong. <laughs> this is why I had issues studying and driving, a symptom called excessive daytime sleepiness. It's also why my knees were buckling when I laughed. See, when I was experiencing an emotion like humor, my brain was misperceiving this for an emotion of dream sleep and sending a signal to my body to paralyze me for a dream while I was awake. That phantom burglar I mentioned, which he came back a few times, this was also because of narcolepsy and the breakdown between dreams and reality. I was experiencing dreamlike content, but part of my brain was too awake, making it feel very real. And I couldn't get away from the burglar because I was paralyzed for dream sleep. That's called sleep paralysis. Honestly, even to this day, I still have to pretty much assume that everything that I see, hear, and feel around the time that I sleep didn't happen. That it was most likely a hallucination of narcolepsy. This has led to a few awkward situations where something I've assumed didn't happen, I found out later from other people, did actually happen. I just simply can't tell the difference. So, having dream sleep move into my daytime life was hugely inconvenient and also terrifying. Around the time I was diagnosed, one morning I woke up and I started walking to the bathroom when I thought of something funny and I began to laugh and my knees started to buckle, but worse than usual. So I kind of braced myself by leaning against the wall at my side and crumbling down to the ground. I wanted to scream out to my roommate to ask for help, but my jaw wasn't under my control. I just let out a mumbled groan. So this is a more full body version of that same paralysis you experience at night you should just never have to experience when you're fully awake. Laying there on the ground, I was fully aware of what was happening. I could feel my body's awkward position. I just couldn't do anything about it. I said to myself, just move a finger, move a toe, Julie, do anything. I wanted to breathe deeper. But my wanting meant nothing. My body was silent to my brain's instructions. So sleep really did bring me down. Um, I like to think of myself, although my doctor never said this, I like to think I'm a professional dreamer. So really what happens when we sleep? We start in this light sleep, stage one, with our eyes closing and rolling back. And then we transition into stage two with bursts of unique brain waves that are believed to be uh, helping our brain form new memories. From there, we transition to stage three, deep sleep, where our breathing and our heart rate become very slow and growth hormones actually secrete. This is when children's bones actually grow. Then we transition into dream sleep, which I've described as that very active sleep with thoughts and emotions and you're paralyzed. Dream sleep is uh, believed to be critical for emotional processing, creativity, problem solving, taking new memories and putting them in a wider context. Dr. Matthew Walker, has described that if you think about sleep just from an information processing standpoint, when we're awake is when we're taking in new information around us. Or in stage two and three sleep is when we begin reflecting on that information, storing and strengthening new memories. And when we're in dream sleep is when we start taking, integrating that new information with our past experiences and memories to help us form a more accurate view of the world around us. So obviously, every part of this process is so important. And this is just one aspect of sleep. I want to describe one other recent discovery. In stage three, that deep sleep, researchers at Boston University just in 2019 discovered that during this time of the sleep, our neurotransmitters, they all shut off at once in unison, something they can't do when we're awake. And when this happens, cerebral spinal fluid rushes in over the brain. What's the fluid doing? Well, it's actually taking out our trash. See, our brain uses about 20% of our body's entire energy. 
leaving waste in the form of gobbled up proteins behind. This process called the glymphatic system is when our brains, mostly while we're sleeping, wash out those leftover proteins that if not removed, build up over time to become a plaque. And that plaque has recently been associated with Alzheimer's disease. So if you do nothing else after this presentation, I hope that as you go to bed tonight, you will consider thanking sleep for taking out your brain <laughs> trash. Seriously, it's the only polite thing to do when someone takes out the trash. However, it's not enough to know what happens when we sleep because we have two major challenges when it comes to accessing sleep's power. The first is sleep loss. The World Health Organization has de declared that there's a sleep loss epidemic among industrial nations like ours. What does this mean? Well, in the short term, lack of sleep impacts our learning, our memory, our decision making, among other things. And long term health consequences include links to obesity, diabetes, and as I've mentioned, Alzheimer's disease. However, I don't think we're usually thinking of long term health consequences because we are constantly surrounded by pressures to do more, work harder. In a culture, where our sense of worth is so tied to our productivity, it is no wonder that working harder often involves skimping on sleep. And I don't need to come into your bedrooms tonight to watch you sleep to know that we have issues with sleep. I can just go to any convenience store in America and look at the amount of space that's taken up by energy drinks, if you haven't done it seriously. Even as I prepared for this presentation today, a huge banner ad popped up on my computer on the internet browser asking me, no time for downtime? The suggested solution was an energy drink. The problem with this is that sleep is not downtime. And an energy drink simply won't do what sleep does. An energy drink may claim to give you wings, but is it taking out your brain trash? For those of you that would like to see if you can get more out of your sleep, Dr. Michael Bruce is a leader in raising awareness about the fact that we don't all have the same sleep and wake needs. By learning about your chronotype, you can see that some people need more sleep than others. Some people have their best productivity at night. Other people have their most clarity in the morning. You can tune into your chronotype and cute corresponding animal to better see that how to plan your sleep and to align your best wakefulness with your productivity. But at the same time, it's important to know that sleep loss goes far beyond our personal control. With socioeconomic factors, school start times, shift work, the safety of one's neighborhood, social pressures and discrimination, all of these things impact our ability to sleep. Sleep equity is a social justice issue. And policy changes are needed at every level to make sure that more people can get the sleep that they need and deserve. There is one thing that we can take better control over today, though, and that is sleep disorders. An estimated one in five Americans lives with a sleep disorder. So statistically speaking, that means between you, the person in front of you, behind you, to your left and right, one of you would have a sleep disorder. So you may wonder which one of them has a sleep disorder. <laughs> Honestly, it'll be hard to tell. Sleep disorders are invisible for the most part. And you'll probably think it's not you that have a sleep disorder. But just know that if it was you, you probably wouldn't know it. Unfortunately, the majority of people living with sleep disorders today are undiagnosed and unaware of what they're up against. So to evaluate whether you could have a sleep condition, ask yourself these two questions. Do you have trouble sleeping throughout the night regularly? And do you have trouble maintaining wakefulness during the day regularly? Remember, having trouble maintaining wakefulness during the day doesn't always mean that you're falling asleep in your cereal bowl. It can look a lot like having a short fuse, not being able to concentrate, not remembering your commute. If even the slightest voice inside you thinks something might not be right, trust that voice. And if you answer yes to either one of these questions, it's important to consult a board-certified sleep specialist to see whether you could have a sleep disorder. This is so important because treatments are available, and finding a community of other people who share a challenge that you have can be life-changing. 
Narcolepsy is just one example. There are many different ways that sleep can break down. <laughs> sort of like a car breaks down, you might not know what the issue is until a specialist takes a look. In speaking to thousands of people living with sleep conditions, I can tell you that everyone's experience is different. For me, living with a sleep disorder means that I know I cannot push myself bullheaded towards my goals by simply working longer hours than other people. I have to be creative, working in my pockets of wakefulness to pursue my goals. And in the 14 years since I've been diagnosed, I've still been able to do some pretty amazing things. I've run three marathons, published a memoir, and founded a nonprofit to make sleep cool. I dare say I have my dream job. <laughs> my greatest hope is that today, you can start writing your own sleep story. Seeing that sleep is not something to avoid, but something to honor. I envision a world where pulling a sleep all-nighter is the new badge of honor, because the rest of our lives may depend on the rest we get during our lives. So let's rest wisely.